for 30 years I've studied this, and more and more people are beginning to understand this. This film broadcast the first time a day before the Copenhagen Top 15. So there have been 12 cops after this. What is going on when we have to discuss this when we actually know that it's possible to rehabilitate large-scale damaged ecosystems? Welcome to Facing Future Television. My name is John Liu. We're very happy to have you here. This is myself. This is Siham Syed from the Habiba community. She will be giving you a discussion about her life and the community. This is Maximilian Abulayesh Bose, who is the sustainable development lead for the Sekem community. And he will be telling you about his work and perhaps the economy of love. And this is Nagla Ahmad, who is the Egyptian Biodynamic Association manager. I have been working in restoration for about 30 years. And I started working at very large scale with the World Bank and the Chinese government, the British government. I was a television cameraman and I was sent out to look at restoration of the Lus Plateau in the upper and middle reaches of the Yellow River. And what was interesting about this is it's in a very remote and wild place. It starts at the headwaters of the Yellow River, which comes out of the Tibetan highlands and moves below the Tibetan Plateau. And what I found when I got there was a fully dysfunctional ecosystem. It was an enormous place which looked more like the moon. It was called the most eroded place on Earth. I first went there in 1994, and it's going to transition to what the Chinese government and the World Bank were able to do by 2009. Many of the human tragedies that we regularly witness around the world, the floods, mudslides, droughts, and famines, are not inevitable. We made a film for the BBC called Hope in a Changing Climate. And we found, essentially, that it's possible to rehabilitate large-scale damaged ecosystems. And that, actually, if people understand this and do the work, we don't need to wait for the policymakers year after year after year not actually doing anything to restore the earth. So what's happened now is for 30 years I've studied this and I've been communicating continuously and more and more people are beginning to understand this. We, this film broadcast the first time a day before the Copenhagen COP15. So there have still been 12 COPs after this. What is going on when we have to discuss this when we actually know that it's possible to rehabilitate large-scale damaged ecosystems? And so I work with the Common Land Foundation the Common Land Foundation has 2 million hectares in privately invested restoration with community groups around the world based on business methods for the, from the four returns. And all over the world, we have these places that are doing this work. These are community development people working in South Africa, but as, as I've been going along, since it's such a long time, I began to have dreams about people going camping and restoring the earth. And at first I thought, this is crazy. What am I thinking with these dreams? But as I continued to have the dreams, I wrote an essay called Earth Restoration Peace Camps. 
and it was published in Permaculture Magazine, and thousands and tens of thousands of people began to say, that's what we want. And so when they did that, we started the Ecosystem Restoration Camps movement. In, and it was six years ago when we started this, and now there are 55 camps in six continents. We're in Somalia, Guatemala, in Mexico, and I've been recommending now that all these camps prepare central kitchens and creator spaces and cultural stages so that we can recycle and upcycle all the wasted materials, that we can stop consuming so much, and that we can make art. And we've been showing that we can restore landscapes at scale and that it's fun. So we're having festivals and people are doing this work. So if you've come to the COP or if you're looking at this television broadcast somewhere and you're not very happy with the way things are going, go out and work for restoration because it's a lot more satisfying. These are our websites. And if you want to see my academic work, you can find films and papers at my academia page. So now we're going to ask Saham to come up. You're going to tell them about your life and your work in the South Sinai, please. Okay. Thank you. Hello. It's nice to be here. My name is Saham. I am Saham Said Salim from Nueva, from Nueva, South Sinai. I am from the Bedouin community here. I am graduate from uh, political science, British University in Cairo and uh, law, uh, and law in Cairo University. So I have two bachelor degree. I am the first Bedouin woman who uh, entered a private university and got a scholarship by USAID. It's not easy for a Bedouin woman uh, to go far from her home to study, to be away without anyone uh, with her. It was a lot of uh, and a huge responsibility. So uh, I, I will take this moment to really, really thank my uh, father um, to, to give me this responsibility, to give me this confidence to go and study there and to continue my education process. For education, I always uh, believe in education. I always believe it's, it's a way of changing. It's a way of changing everything. It's a way uh, of changing what we have uh, today from climate change and what we have from uh, uh, crisis that we have been faced and to mitigate climate change. So I would take this moment to thank Mr. Magda Said and his Habiba community model for greening the desert, for like preserving water security. And I will say something that's from Quran, that we make from water everything is living. So we have to conserve our environment, we have to conserve our water, especially we have here in Sinai, like we are in, in the desert. So we have to, we have to do something for our environment. I want to take also at this moment to say to the world the message from a Bedouin women that want to say the world is live the life simply, live it easy, don't use extra resources, just adjust your life with what you have from resources that is need, and don't hurt the environment. So leave it easy, leave it simply without using extra resources. Thank you. Max. Okay, thank you very much for giving me the floor here to talk about another initiative that has started to take ecosystem restoration as its core. We are part of the Ecosystem Restoration Camp Network and we are proud to be an Egyptian initiative. Myself, I came 12 years to Egypt and explored this place that was founded in the desert. As you can see here, a desert is not a very uh, easy environment to start, but a miracle eventually happened because my grandfather-in-law, he was very moved by the challenges in the 1977, and he wanted to set an impulse 
for cultural renewal and for human development and for ecosystem restoration, where sustainable development is part of the core mission and where every individual can unfold its potential and following ethical and environmental sound principles. So thanks to this visionary who had this dear to his heart and people who joined this Mission Impossible, um, we are seeing something that is growing today and we will hear more about that uh, later from Nagla, how this is growing. When you see these pictures, you can understand what happens after 45 years when you reclaim a desert and when you build a community around it. It is not really an easy mission when you think about the 1970s when Ibrahim said he wanted to green the desert based on biodynamic principles. There was no biodynamic or organic market at that time, but still he engaged in this mission impossible and I think that is a very important message to the world that you can start even in a very, very harsh environment with persistence and that you will make it and that being crazy is not not bad. It's a good thing, I think, nowadays when we think about the societal transformation we need. So follow your heart is the message and you will get through. But when he left us in 2017 as a community, we asked ourselves, what can we do? Where does the journey go in the next 40 years? And what we came up with is a set of vision goals that are dear to our heart, that are in four dimensions of life, reflecting our holistic approach and where we kind of envision the future, how it can be in 40 years. But we engage in research in all of these fields and try to come up with a prototype, a prototype where people can see that it works. And if the prototype is successful, we can engage in upscaling and mainstreaming. I want to show you this as an example for one of the prototypes of one of the uh, second vision goals that is very dear to our heart, namely uh, the one about organic, sustainable, or biodynamic, however you want to call it, agriculture. So we, of course, already have developed an agricultural model for the future, but we want all Egypt by 2057 to follow a sustainable, regenerative agricultural model. That's our vision. And we have done a lot of research why organic agriculture addresses so many societal issues simultaneously, especially when you look from it from a true cost perspective. Uh, true cost means that you include all social and environmental externalities into the equation. And then you can see biodynamic agriculture is more efficient and more valuable for society. But the problem was that this was not yet recognized until we created a prototypes that worked with high quality carbon credits that were acknowledging one of the positive externalities from uh, sustainable farming. I mean, in this COP we have seen so much a discussion about the potential of sustainable agriculture to turn the climate crisis around and be the major solution for climate change in terms of removing carbon from the atmosphere. And we have seen this in our own farms. We have seen that with every hectare we are cultivating, a lot of carbon can be stored in the trees, in the soil, but also avoided through compost making and renewable energy. And this is the prototype we wanted to show to everyone, especially our farmers. And when it comes to our farmers, um, the potential for upscaling is great. We are working with 2,000 farmers in all over Egypt. Nagla will elaborate on that but the key important message here is that every farmer with around two hectares in average can sequester 44 tons of carbon instead of emitting. And that's a huge game changer. That's a huge also change in the life of a farmer who suddenly earns more money from the carbon credits and can actually be financed in his transition towards sustainable agriculture. That's a solution that is available right now. And I think this is what we're going to take out of COP. To, to largely uh, become here mainstream. And we are talking about a transition of more than 40,000 farmers that can be brought on the way towards biodynamic, regenerative agriculture. And this does not have to be financed by government or by the farmer. This comes from the 
corporate sector that is offsetting their unavoidable emissions. And I think here we found a good solution and we cannot work through this alone and knowing about is not enough. Of course, we must do it, but we are already doing it. And I want to invite also Nagla here uh, on stage. She is managing the Egyptian Biodynamic Association. That's the association that is managing all the farmers that are working together with SICM. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Um, this is a great opportunity. Uh, it comes not only every year. My name is Nagla Ahmed. I'm working the manager of the Egyptian Biodynamic Association. And the, uh, it concerns with the, with the farmers who are not able to transit from conventional farming to organic. The Egyptian Biodynamic Association was established in 1992 to work with very few farmers who believed in the vision of the transition but not all over Egypt and not all over the farmer was having this intention. Uh, therefore, we worked hard on the prototype with those people just to consider them as leaders and multipliers to disseminate the organic agricultural practices. Till th since five years, we worked on new initiatives uh, like uh, uh, disseminating the organic agriculture and upscale it to reach 500 farmers uh, and starting working with the economy of love standard addressing the holistic approach of sustainable development. And while we're working on this aspect, we're already tackling the ecosystem, regenerative agriculture, and addressing the climate change. Economy of Love is addressing the environmental aspects since active regeneration of the environment through the organic and biodynamic farming practices, also addressing the cultural aspect, which empowering the lifelong learning and the education to co-create knowledge from them and to us to work and develop much more research on the ground. The economical aspect, which is have the fair creation on distribution of the value to all the stakeholders, transparent of the product from where, who produce it and to where, and also the societal uh, through working with the people to unfold their potential. From prototyping, Economy of Love is presenting some dimensions like certification, standards and how it would uh, help the farmers to get certified afterwards, education during the uh, learning and the awareness and sessions of what is the organic agriculture and how it would be disseminated and as a holistic economical approach. Also introducing the carbon credit initiative, which incentivizes the farmer just to produce the organic product to be sold like the conventional one in the market, not only for export. Uh, this to secure selling all over the products here in Egypt and get this incentive through different application and practices uh, of organic agriculture like planting trees, uh, working on renewable energy, the soil content of carbon and forming compost to sequester the carbon. Therefore, we started uh, as Egyptian Biodynamic Association and SECAM to work with the Cairo Exchange to announce the voluntary market of the carbon credit initiative. Then we are working on the upscaling. We started, as I mentioned, with 2,000 farmers since two years. Now we are addressing by 2023, 40,000 farmers. And for the old info, we have seven manual farmers in Egypt. Each farmer, if he has one fedden, he emits five tons of carbon each year. But he is producing through the organic agriculture practices and working on the carbon credit, he will sequester 25 tons per year. This means that he is not working positive to the climate change, but negative and has a great impact through uh, producing organic agricultural products and get profit more than producing conventional products. And proudly and finally to say, I'm so proud to reflect my passion and my love to working with the Egyptian farmers uh, to support them as from the concept, each day is a school day and I'm learning from all the people each day. Thank you. Well, we don't have much time, but uh, I would just like to say that uh, we don't need to wait. We don't need to think that the policy makers or the legal or the financial communities are in the lead on restoration. The real leaders are the people in the, who are working on the ground. 
anyone who's making a compost pile or planting trees or restoring the infiltration and retention of water is doing more than coming into a temporary building with diesel generators to blow air conditioning out through open doors in the desert while negotiating emissions control. I can fully back that. But first, I think we should do uh, next year a meeting where we celebrate greening the desert together and we talk about climate change uh, and addressing it on the farm and be connected with a nice festival. What do you think? <laughs> I think by next year we would announce the third version of True Costa Accounting to all people. Uh, with all the impacts on environment, health, and cultural and societal. Uh, this would be after the currencies changing and the floods, uh, and also the uh, much more impacts we realized through the practice of the humans since decades. Thank you. I hope, uh, inshallah, next year, like we have uh, more and more green in the green desert, and inshallah, we have more goals uh, to conserve and water security. Uh, inshallah, next year. Thank you. Thank you so much. Please join the Ecosystem Restoration Camps Movement. <laughs>